Uh, so uh, now we can uh, start uh, today's lecture uh, in earnest. Any questions? Any questions? Questions? All right. So, so far we have seen that the electrostatic field, that is the field that is generated by static charge distributions, immovable charges, uh, satisfies Gauss's law. So this is Gauss's law that we uh, discussed and uh, that basically says that if you calculate this flux of the electric field through a closed surface S, that will be equal to the enclosed charge. And we argued that this is basically equivalent to Coulomb's law and the fundamental observable of electricity because this flux will be positive if there is a positive charge. So that means that the electric flux lines the electric vector will be coming out of the volume if the volume is uh, overwhelmingly positively charged or they will be sinking into the volume if the volume is negatively charged. So this is the first law. The electrostatic field also satisfies a second law uh, which says that uh, if you have an electrostatic field and let me draw the field lines like this for the electric field and uh, you take a closed path integral from point 1 to point 2 so uh, you go from point 1 from here to point 2 and then you come back and this can be an arbitrary path C so this is a closed path C, and you take the line integral along this closed path, that will end up being zero. So the closed path integral of the electrostatic field uh, is line integral is always uh, zero. So what is uh, that DL? DL will be uh, the differential is small, the differential length elements that you can also find in our age sheet for different coordinate systems. So you imagine that you split the path in differentially small uh, segments, dl, and at every segment, at every segment, um, you take this dot product between the electric field and uh, dl. So each one of these uh, little arrows represents a dl uh, locally along this path. And we will see examples uh, to understand a little bit better what this L may be. What is the physical meaning now of this law? Well, if I imagine that I had a charge Q If I imagine that I had a charge Q inside this, in the, is inside this electric field and the electric field was pushing it along this closed path, then we know that electric field is force per unit charge. So if that charge Q is within the electric field E, it receives a Coulomb force. That Coulomb force will be QE. Okay. So the work done by this Coulomb force on this closed path So this work can be calculated as F dot DL. That's how we calculate work done by a force that is moving an object. So that means that this would be Q dot QE dot DL. 
So that would be Q times electric field dot DL. And that means that this would be zero, and hence the work would be zero. So essentially, the work done by the electric field force over a closed path integral is zero, just like gravity, gravitational force. And this is why we call the gravitational field conservative. And you see that the electrostatic field also is a conservative field. So the electrostatic field, the field of static charges, is conservative. And that simply means that the work done by uh, the field over over a closed path is zero. So uh, as we have seen, the electric forces and the electric phenomena have many uh, things different from gravity. However, this is something that they uh, share in common. So no matter how, uh, what uh, uh, paths I choose, then uh, the sum will be equal to uh, zero. And that has another implication. Anybody can see what is this, the implication of uh, having the always, no matter how I go from one to two and back, um, an implication from that fact? Displacement of, the Displacement of what? I think he has an idea. Yeah, go ahead. That's right. So the implication is that this integral is path independent. So the integral from point one to point two is path independent. For any two points within the field that I call one and two. And if you want to see this, if we take one and two, and let's say we want to go from one to two through path C1, and then we have also chosen another path, C2. We know from this law of electrostatics, and I'd like to mention that in many books you will see people trying to prove the law. So these are laws of experimental physics, and therefore there is no proof to be, to be done. Uh, this is what Feynman says, the subtle difference between mathematics and physics. Here, this is based on observables, observations, measurements, and therefore, I don't prove anything here. This is what we know from our observations, and hence, we build the theory around this observation. So, coming back to this path independence, let's say that I choose two paths to go from 1 to 2, C1 and C2. But I know that if I were to go from, uh, along C1 from 1 to 2 and then come back along C2, but in the opposite direction, this law would tell me that the closed path integral will have to be zero. But now immediately you see that this integral, C2, minus, what I called minus C2, which follows the same uh, path from 2 to 1, but in the opposite direction with respect to C2, is exactly minus 
the integral from 1 to 2 of C2. And therefore you see that necessarily as a consequence of this law, C1 is equal to C2, those integrals. And hence this integral is path independent. Any questions up to this point or any uh, doubts that uh, this is a path independent integral? So one may ask why do I care anyway that this may be path independent or not? So the next definition will actually uh, resolve why we, we care. Definition is electric potential difference V2 minus V1 or V21 as uh, the textbook calls it. Electric potential difference between two points in an electrostatic field is defined as minus the integral from point 1 to point 2 of E dot DL. Okay. So this, uh, this is actually what we call commonly voltage. So this name for electric potential difference is basically a technical term for what is commonly known as voltage. And you see now that this definition is possible precisely because this guy here is path independent. You see here I have tons of wires uh, that connect to microphones and then to batteries and so on. Your battery that you buy as let's say 1.5 volts is does the voltage that it provides does not depend on how you connect the wires. So this is the physical consequence of this mathematical fact that this integral is path independent. No matter how you connect your, wire, your wires to the battery, the company that sells you the battery actually tells you the truth that it will provide 1.5 volts. You may choose the wires to go wherever you like, or I may actually twist them and turn them and so on. The voltage won't change. And that is precisely because this is path independent. And if it wasn't path independent, voltage would not be a thing. OK, would not be a thing. Nobody would care about uh, this definition. Now, uh, there are some uh, interesting things to be said here. First of all, you see here this minus sign. And uh, in order to understand physically what voltage means, and by the way, you see here from the, uh, before I forget, you see here from the definition that the units of voltage are units of electric field times meters. So it is Newton per Coulomb times meters. And this unit, we actually call it volt. So Alessandro Volta, the scientist from uh, Pavia, Italy, uh, was the one who investigated, uh, put a lot of work into early forms of batteries and, and hence uh, it is uh, an honor to uh, this work that we are using this unit of uh, volt. So volta is the person, volt is the unit. Um, and um, now that we have the unit also I can uh, state an alternative uh, form of the units of the electric field. So you see from here that Newton per Coulomb is volt per meter. So indeed, we had said this uh, since I showed you a table by the government on, on um, limits of exposure of uh, people to electric fields, where the electric fields had been stated in volt per meter. So this is the more common unit for the electric field that we'll be using uh, going forward. So now, 
in order to understand what does a volt mean when we buy a 1.5 volt battery what does that mean okay um, so you see the definition in order to appreciate the definition you can imagine here that you multiply by a charge Q and you divide by a charge Q So then I can say that this is equal to 1 over Q minus QE dot DL. And it may seem again like a mathematical intricacy that I have this minus sign to deal with, but this actually has a clear physical meaning. What is this now? This is again work, but it's not work done by the electric field force because the electric field force is Q times electric field, right? This is minus Q, time, Q times electric field. So this is work done against the electric field and the formula tells you that if you do work against the electric field, Work per, per unit charge is actually the voltage between the two points, which means that the voltage is raised if you work against the electric field. Notice the similarity with gravity. If I push my chalk against gravity, I'm raising its potential energy. If I let it go down, it loses its potential energy. So the potential energy in gravitational fields is reduced along the direction of the force of the field. Same thing here. If you want to raise the potential, it's like raising the bars in weightlifting, you need to do work against the electric field. And this minus sign is there to tell you exactly that you need to do it against the electric field. So this is basically, that is the physical meaning of the voltage, is work against the electric field, per unit charge. Okay? So that is the definition. And I'll pause here, I will uh, clean the board to give you a few examples of uh, potential difference in various electric fields that we have seen before. And in the meantime, please think about this. If you come up with any questions, I'll be happy to discuss them. So I will leave only the definition of potential difference, which is voltage. Okay. Otherwise, work per unit charge. Any questions? Yes. Uh, I didn't understand why you did a negative sign uh, when you were trying to find the voltage of from two to one. Why is it minus one by two? So I don't try right now. I'm giving a definition. So I'm giving the definition that the potential difference is uh, defined as minus 1 to 2 e dot dl. Okay? And the physical meaning is just like gravity. If you want to increase, if you have an object like this one, you want to increase its potential energy, you need to push against the electric field, against the, the gravitational field. So likewise here, this shows you that for this to be positive, that is to raise the, the electric uh, potential uh, between one and two, you need to do work against the electric field. If you are doing work, if the electric field does the work and an object collapses, let's say, or an, a, a, an electron or a proton is being pushed by the electric field and moves from this point one to two, then its potential difference will be negative. Just like if I let the chalk uh, fall to the ground, its potential, its uh, gravitational potential energy will actually decrease. Right? So that is the meaning of this minus. So let's take a few fields that we know. First example, uh, the point charge. So I'm putting a point charge at the origin. Uh, Q Oops. 
and Z. Okay. And then I uh, take points one and two. They are totally arbitrary. Uh, and I want to find V2 minus V1. Okay. So let's, for the sake of simplicity, redraw this on the plane of the board so that you can see it more clearly. So here I have the point charge. And let R1 represent the distance of point 1 from the charge. And R2 represents the distance of point 2 from the charge. Okay. So to find the uh, potential difference, I can choose whichever path I want. And I want to uh, remind you that the electric field here would be q by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared in the radial direction. So the path that I will choose will start from 1. So of course I can choose any path I want from 1 to 2. This integral uh, is path independent. However, you see that this integral inside here has a dot product. Remember that there are two cases where the dot product is actually very easy to compute. When the two vectors are parallel or anti-parallel, where it is equal to the magnitude of the product of the magnitudes of the two vectors, or when the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, when it is even easier, the dot product, then it is zero. Okay? So I will try, given that the electric field points in this direction, in the radial direction, I will try to choose paths to go from 1 to 2 that are either perpendicular to the electric field, and they give me zero in that integral, or parallel to the electric field, and then I can do the calculation very easily. So a path like this is the one that starts from a circle going from 1 to 1 prime. So this is a circle around the point charge, or an arc. Uh, let me draw it here a little bit more easily for you to see. So if uh, I have this point charge and I draw two circles around the charge, the first is uh, has radius R1, so the point 1 is here, and then point 2 is here, radius R2. Okay. I start by going along this circle like this, from 1 to, let's say, 1 prime. So this is my first path. Notice that along this path, the electric field is perpendicular. Because the electric field emanates from the point charge radially outwards. And then once I make it to 1 prime, then I will go along the field to 2. So I will, uh, I will calculate V2 minus V1 as minus E dot DL, that is my definition. And that gives me, I split the integral from 1 to 1 prime and then from 1 prime to 2. Okay, so that is uh, how I will do it. 
And then you see that this first integral will be zero because the electric field is normal to dl. So e dot dl is zero. Hence, it just goes away. And the next one will have a DL that will be parallel to the electric field. If you go again to your age sheet and you look at differential length elements, you will find, for the spherical coordinate system, you will find three. The R, the theta, and the phi. The one that is parallel to this radially directed field is actually the radially directed element, and that is the R, dr. So I'm moving along the radial direction, and now this one is one. So all in all, I have minus q by 4 pi epsilon naught 1 to 2 dr over r squared. Or 1 prime to 2. Okay? So this is the integration that I need to carry out. So that is equal to q by 4 pi epsilon naught integral of minus 1 over r squared. That integral is 1 over r. 1 over r derivative is minus 1 over r squared. So this integral is basically 1 over r. At point 1 prime, 1 prime is on the circle, so the distance from the origin is r1. And of course, at 2, the distance from the origin is r2. So this integration is done from r2, from r1 to r2, and the potential difference is q by 4 pi epsilon naught 1 over r2 minus 1 over r1. Okay, so that is the potential difference. So any questions up to this point and the uh, process that I followed? You see that uh, I leverage the path independence of the integral and then I notice that there is this dot product inside that would give me trouble unless E and DL are either parallel or perpendicular. And then I have in, I'm using this freedom of choosing the, the path accordingly. So I choose, I choose paths where the DL is either perpendicular to the electric field, like it happens from 1 to 1 prime, or parallel as it happens from 1 prime to 2. And you can always make that choice. Yes? Uh, I didn't understand why you choose the path like uh, radially for R2, but curvature for R1. <coughs> um, sorry, uh, say that question again. So I want to go from, uh, from 1 to 2, right? Yeah, 1 to 2. So why did you take like 1 to 1 prime? That's a great question. I could have done the, I could have done the opposite as well. Uh, so you can do this uh, as well and you can confirm that. So your classmate is saying, why didn't I do this? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, this would give the same result, guaranteed. So you can try it. That would give you exactly the same result. So in this case, you would get this integral from one to one double prime, let's say, and then you would get zero from one double prime to two. Okay, so that is, uh, that's a great question. Any other, yes? No, I absorbed the minus sign here. Uh, because uh, you see uh, d dr of one over r is minus one over r squared. Right, so that minus sign has been absorbed. Yes? Why do we do uh, 1 over r2 minus 1 over r1, not r1 prime? Uh, because 1 prime is on this circle. So its distance from the charge is again r1. 
You see how I defined it? I drew the circle. So this uh, point is not an arbitrary point. It's on that same circle. Or if you want to see it three-dimensionally, so it's on the same sphere as, um, as point one. So that was the, that was the point, uh, right? I wanted to stay at the same distance. Yes? The one and the two are just like the locations for the point, right? Because, uh, or are they like the distance? No, they are two points in the field. Okay. They are two points. So when you're saying one primary, just for You can imagine that they are the two poles of your battery. And the battery is generated in an electric field, and you are trying to find the voltage, right? You go from one to two. There is, uh, I, I don't attach any greater significance to this. OK. Uh, so one may uh, wonder, OK, I have here potential difference, V2 minus V1. But what are actually these numbers? What is V2 and what is V1? So electric potential, this is uh, my second definition. Electric potential V is actually at a of a point is the potential difference between this point and another point that we choose as a reference and we assign to it zero potential. So I want to emphasize that voltage is a meaningful, physically meaningful quantity. But potential is not a physically meaningful quantity. So the difference between, of the potential between the two is what is physically meaningful. So if I get a battery, I know that the potential difference between the poles, a 1.5 volt battery, obviously, is 1.5 volts, OK? So then I can, by convention, say that this 1.5 means that the bottom has 1 and the top has 2.5. Or that the bottom has minus 1 and the top has plus 1.5. This is all by convention. It's like altitude where you take a reference point and then you calculate it. But what actually has physical meaning is the difference between the two points. And likewise here. So in order to define an electric potential, we have basically to go and say, I pick a point where I set the potential to zero, and then I measure the potential difference of everything else with respect to that point. This is what in electric circuits you call the ground. So when we say that um, the ground of my circuit is at that point, you have a digital bus, and you say, OK, the substrate here, I assign to it zero potential. Uh, that is not physically meaningful. It's your convention. I set this to zero. And then once I set this to zero, then I measure everything else with respect to that. And what I measure, that potential difference now becomes the potential of the other points. So electric potential V, not potential difference, voltage, electric potential uh, at a point P is the potential difference with respect to a reference uh, point. I squeezed quite a bit here. And we basically assign to that reference point uh, the potential of 0. We assign. So that is a, con a convention. So let me just write it here. Electric potential at a point P is the potential difference with respect to a reference point where we assign zero potential. So here, that point 1 will become the reference, and this point 2 will become P. Okay. So that is the definition of the absolute potential. Again, 
total convention, so only the potential difference has a physical meaning. So if we go back here, now that we found the potential difference between two points, and uh, Let's say we want to find the potential that is being generated at points around a point charge. So again, this is uh, my geometry. I have a point charge at the origin. And now, let's say I have here a reference point. And here another point where I want to find the potential, and that point has distance r from the uh, distance r from the charge. Okay. So I go and I take a reference point and I assign to it the potential zero. So I say that v at r reference is equal to zero. Then I have V of R equals to Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R minus R reference. So this is now the potential, uh, the absolute potential at the point R. So I know that this is the potential difference between the two points. Okay, so now you see this is V of R minus V of R reference. So now I substitute 1 and 2 with the point where I'm interested to calculate the potential and 1 is now the reference point that has zero potential by definition. So this is what, what I have. So because now I assign to this V reference a zero value, this expression becomes the potential that I have at that point. And there is, in this case, a very convenient place to choose the reference. Any ideas where can I take the reference point? Where? You need to be ground. There is no ground here. Yes. Infinity. So if I now take the reference to infinity, you see this expression is cleaned up because the second term goes to zero. And it is a natural choice because you sort of look at this expression. I'm sure that some of the uh, looks that I'm getting come from this that you see here this q by 4 pi epsilon naught reference and you say, okay, I, I thought this was v reference and therefore why is it not zero? But no, what we calculated here was the potential difference between those two points. And then I go and I say, I set this to zero and I make this my reference. And then this expression becomes the potential at that point. Yes, please. So, so the positive complete the charge from infinity, the more negative the potential becomes? The no. Or is it because of the sign in the integral that we're measuring the positive? No, no, because you see, q by 4 pi epsilon not our reference, the reference point does not change. Your reference is fixed. So the only thing that changes is r, and what would happen in your thought experiment is that as you come Closer to the charge, the potential just goes to infinity. R goes to zero, the potential goes to infinity. But that's only if the charges, are, that's only if the charges are alike. Or no, that's only if Q is a positive charge. Right? That's right. I was thinking of a negative charge. In that case, would it be negative? So if this charge would be negative? Yeah, because if I'm coming closer, yes. what is being done on the charge? Yes, it would be negative. Why would it be negative? Because what is being done on the charge? No, because now the neg so 
the potential of a negative charge would be negative because now yeah. if I bring in a positive charge, the negative charge attracts it. So, the field, uh, does the work. so therefore the field does the work and hence the potential as you go closer decreases. Uh, okay, so it's like the ground, yes. Just to put into perspective, uh, the RF here is infinity just because we want to have a voltage reference that will eventually become zero, right? So um, it works. Let me put it that way. It works really well here. So it cleans up the expression. I don't need to carry a reference point. Mind you, as I will show, this is not always possible. But here, it is possible. So I'm getting a cleaner expression. It is up to me. What I want to emphasize here is that the only thing that makes physical sense is the potential difference. It's work working in charge. And then the reference point, you needed to define absolute potential. And um, the reference point is up to you to choose. And just like we chose the path in order to clean up the integration and make it as, as easy as possible, I can choose here, as I see this expression, our reference to infinity, to make it a cleaner expression. Because if I take our reference to infinity, then V of R becomes Q by 4 pi epsilon R. Okay, so this is the uh, potential that is generated by a point uh, charge. Okay, any other questions? So just to uh, make an observation here, maybe I will go uh, back for a moment to... So this is uh, the case that uh, we're looking at. From your applet, from the applet from your textbook. Okay. So this applet now shows, first of all, there is a positive charge at the origin. And then, you see the electric field that emanates from the charge outwards. It has also plotted with this color code what they call here the potential field, and that is V. That is Q by 4 pi epsilon naught R. That you see it goes to infinity close to the charge and then uh, decreases as you go away. And now you see all these circles. These circles have been drawn with the center of the circles being the charge itself. So for all these circles, R is fixed. A circle means it has this, every point has the same distance from the center. So all these points have the same distance from the charge. And because they have the same distance from the charge, they, are, they have also the same potential. So all these points on the circles that you see, and in fact all the points on a sphere, on any sphere surrounding the charge, would have the same potential because they would have the same R and Q by, by 4 pi epsilon R would be the same. So these are called equipotential surfaces uh, or equipotentials and they are characteristic lines for uh, a, an electrostatic uh, potential that we're interested in uh, figuring out how they, they look like. So in this case they look like spheres the intersection of the sphere and the plane of uh, my screen is a circle, and these are the circles that you are seeing here. And something that we will show systematically is that the electric field always is normal to those equipotential surfaces. So always on these equipotential surfaces, the electric field will be normal. This is not uh, especially true for this case. It is uh, true for any case, as we will see um, later. All right, so let me mute the projector and go back to say a few more things about potentials. Okay. 
So the question now remains, and it's the last one that I will uh, take up today, why do we care about this? So why do we say if the battery is 1.5 volts and we don't specify, let's say, the electric field of the battery with a vector diagram, right? Um, and the answer to this is that it is very difficult to measure a vector. But we have measurement equipment that measures scalar things, like temperature, like here, the voltage. And the most important thing is that once you have the voltage and you measure the voltage that a charge distribution generates, for example, the voltage in a capacitor that you have seen since high school, then you can find the electric field. In other words, there is a relation between the electric field and the voltage. So again, going back to our definition of V21, the potential difference, you see that this potential difference is built along the path from 1 to 2. With small building blocks being this expression here. So I can just say that as I go along this path, I have from each of these segments some dV that is being contributed to the voltage and builds the potential. Just like before when I was going from R1 to R2 uh, or from here to here, let's say, for every point along this path you have this build-up of the potential with small building blocks, the Legos of potential being these terms E dot DL. So these dVs are minus E dot DL. E dot DL. So let me, I don't know where this came from, that is the one, E dot DL. If I expand this relation from calculus, I know that dV is theta V by theta x dx. This is a function of three coordinates, theta V by theta y dy plus theta V by theta z dz. So generally, this, has, this depends on all three coordinates. Minus E dot dl is a dot product. So I will expand it in the same way. So the electric field in general has three components. DL in general also has three components. And the dot product is the product component by component, and then you add them all up. So that will give you minus EX DX, minus EY DY, minus EZ DZ. So if you compare these two green formulas, this one and this one here, you conclude that You conclude that EX is minus theta V by theta X. EY is minus theta V by theta Y. EZ is minus theta V by theta Z. So in fact, we have a recipe of calculating the electric field from the potential which we can measure. And this, is, uh, this can be stated in a compact form as electric field is equal to minus the gradient of the potential. So I'll stop here and uh, we'll uh, do some examples where we will see uh, how this works uh, tomorrow. So thanks for your attention. See you tomorrow.